good lighting today. A bit brighter. Hello everybody, I'm Sarah and I'm a recorder player. As recorder players or as musicians, a lot of us have students. Students where we are trying to impart all of our musical wisdom, give them as much knowledge as possible, but also keep them inspired. But how can you keep your students motivated? It's fantastic when you have a student that just loves playing music. They don't need any persuasion to practice or to go on to another piece or to keep going. Of course, it's not like this for everybody. And I think we all have students that find it difficult to practice, to find time, to find the motivation. How can you help them? Today, I'm gonna give you my five top tips for motivating your students. Of course, this won't work for everybody and this isn't the be all and end all of teaching and this video very definitely has an ulterior motive. Uh, you, my viewers, are always fantastic at leaving your stories and your experiences in the comments and I always really enjoy reading them <laughs> and I am hoping that a lot of you will write with your tips for motivating your students because I'm always happy to have more. I've just put a dark jumper on and I think that makes the lighting a bit better. There we go. Before we go into my five top tips for motivating your students, I think it's important to mention one thing. If you're making any kind of agreements with your students on how much they should be practicing, make sure you actually talk about what practice is. What is practice? It sounds obvious, but that's only because it's obvious to us as musicians. For a new student, it could be a completely weird and abstract concept. For example, with some of my students, I was agreeing that they would practice five days per week. But then they asked me, like, does it count if you practice three different pieces? Is that like three lots of practice? Or if you play a piece twice, is that two lots of practice? Or what if you practice in the morning and then in the evening? And what is it? Well, if you are asking your students to do something without properly defining exactly what it is, it can be really confusing. And nothing is more demotivating than not understanding the task that you've been asked to do. I have that too. If I'm not really sure how to go about something, I just procrastinate and think, oh. Whatever you choose to do, make sure that your student understands it. And of course, I think it goes without saying, every student will be different. Um, you wouldn't ask someone studying in a conservatorium to practice for five minutes a day and you wouldn't ask your new six-year-old to practice for four hours a day. So I'm not going to tell you as a teacher how much or what to prescribe, but just some more. Tip number one. Stickers! Never underestimate the power of stickers. This is my sticker folder. It says here sticker mop. That is Dutch. Mop means uh, like a folder, this kind of ring binder thing. And inside you can see I have basically the world's greatest collection of stickers. To be honest, before I started with stickers, I was thinking, my students aren't gonna like this. They're gonna blatantly see through me and see that I'm just trying to bribe them to practice. But no way, it works. And actually this kind of small reward system we see also in many, many different areas of adult life as well. For example, if you give blood in the UK, a blood donation, you get a card colour coded to how many times you've given blood. Adults also thrive on rewards. I really believe in positive reinforcement and that is why I give stickers. How do I do this? Each of my students has a small notebook that they bring to every lesson. I write down the pieces that I, they are going to practice for next week. Underneath this, I draw them a recorder um, with either four or five holes, depending a bit on their age and how much I think they can cope with. But basically, each of these holes represents a practice session. Every time they have a practice session at home, they can colour in a hole. And if they come back next week with all of the holes filled in, they get to choose a sticker. 
back. I keep it really, really clear. No exceptions, no saying, oh, well, you did that very well, have a sticker. I keep it really clear so that they know um, what they're working towards. So for my really young new students, they have four holes to colour in. For a bit more the advanced students, they have five holes. My reasoning is that there are seven days in the week. One day is your lesson day, and another day is your rest day, and the rest of the days do a little bit of practice, all of those days. <laughs> the stickers they particularly love are these donut ones. I used to have pizza stickers that genuinely smelled like pizza. They were disgusting. Um, my students love them. So in this way in the lesson, I'm actually rewarding, I'm not so much rewarding performance, but effort. So if you want to find a way to help your students to do regular practice, the sticker method is one that I found really works. Last year I went to a whole conference for recorder teachers and uh, a colleague of mine, Georgina Murphy Clifford, gave this fantastic tip and I tried it out and it really works. And that is recorder of the week. It sounds simple, but you also want to introduce your students to the fact that there is more to the recorder world than just their recorder and their book. So I started every week bringing in a different recorder. Even something as simple for us as the alto recorder can be completely mind-blowing to a new student, regardless of age. It could be a 415 recorder as opposed to a 441, or a Renaissance build as opposed to a Baroque build, or a giant pet sold, or... Yes, without a doubt, the favourite of all of my students is the Gark line. I feel with my students, it's really good to hammer home that you can play all the different sizes of the recorder. It's not only about the one that you are learning in the lesson. And I really like to show them, hey, look, the recorder is a fantastic professional instrument and you can do all of these things with it. And this brings me to tip number three. I am aware that a lot of you may not have the whole full range of recorders at your disposal and that's absolutely fine because we have the wonder of YouTube. I know for a fact that you have YouTube. My tip number three is listening. Increasingly online there are so many videos and recordings of professional recorder players, of different styles of music, of different people performing all the different sizes and I really like to show my students this. In fact with one group of four and five year old children I would do a weekly um, kind of basic music class. The last five minutes of the lesson were always the listening minutes and we'd watch a different YouTube video and it was nice because we'd all just sit down on the floor together, we'd all rest and relax a bit and I would pick a nice video for us to watch. I'm gonna put some links down below to interesting music videos I like to show. Of course, they don't have to be about the recorder or even about classical music, though I do really like to show those videos. Um, Favourites with my students are the pop music videos of a band called OK Go. You just have to see what they do in their videos. It's fas fascinating. And you can also couple these listening exercises with things like drawing what you hear, making graphic scores, moving on the music, or just closing your eyes and listening. Which brings me to tip number four. You can also connect non-musical things to your music. Now, every student learns differently. You do have some students that where everything just comes really fast and they love playing all the notes. I also have students that much prefer to play by ear who prefer to compose. I have students who are really strong in non-musical areas. For example, writing a story or a poem, drawing, or even more technological science type things. And these can all really be built into your music lesson. For example, my six-year-old student that was quite struggling with the motoric movement of just simply getting your fingers on the recorder, she had a real talent for words. So when she was struggling to learn simple melodies, we made up lyrics for the songs, uh, and then we used those lyrics to make up her own new compositions. So we were still working in a musical way, but with her strengths. I had students who 
maybe were dyslexic and would struggle with reading the notes but were actually really good at drawing so we would make compositions by drawing a graphic score or we would listen to music and draw what we heard and this was really developing your ears and developing your imagination and I have one young boy who let's be honest I don't think he really loved playing the recorder, but he was really into making science experiments. So my task for him every week was to come with an idea for a different experiment. And this could be, what sounds louder? A C on the recorder or a C on the piano? Can you play the recorder while jumping up and down on one leg? Why do bigger recorders sound lower? The list is endless but this was really getting him to be curious about music and about the recorder and to approach it in a bit of a different way. And in this way, by combining things that your students are really into and really play with their strengths, it gives a confidence boost, it gives motivation, and it gives yeah, that extra energy to tackle the things that they may then find difficult. Your students can really tell when you listen to them and when you take them seriously. And rather than just saying, no, you're doing this specific task wrong, and that means you're bad. That's demotivating. If you say, okay, I hear you. Let's work on it together. How are we gonna do this? Okay, then yeah, that's motivating. Tip number five. There is the saying, it takes people to make a village. Is that a saying? Did I just completely make up that? In any case, the people around you, your friends, family and community can be a great source of motivation. Let's have a concert at home. I sometimes ask my students to perform their pieces at home for their family. For example, around the dinner table, just play it through. My students often come into the lessons and say that they played their recorder for their grandma or for their uncle or for their school in assembly and they're always so proud. But having a family member listen to you and go like, oh, that was so good, that can be really motivating. What I sometimes do is I let a student bring a few members of their family or friends and then we do a little mini concert within the lesson. I did this recently with a student of mine and he actually brought to the lesson his mum, his brother, two friends from school and his friend from school's dad. They were all there in our little lesson room and beforehand we'd made a whole handwritten program of the pieces he was going to play and we practiced walking on stage and bowing and he gave a little introduction to the pieces and he was so proud. It was just really, really nice to see. <laughs> it was quite motivating for me as a teacher as well for him as a student. <laughs> I'm so curious to hear your tips. Please write them down below and I will try them out and that would be great. And of course, not all of these things have to work for everybody and every student, every style of teaching. So please share your experiences below. As always, thank you so much to all the people watching my channel. Please subscribe to Team Recorder. We're on our way to 2000 subscribers. This is incredible to me. I didn't know there were that many recorder players in the world. Um, and like this video, you don't have to be a recorder player to subscribe. <laughs> Have a nice day and see you next week.